reasonably, was government overreach. This hearing today is another example of committee Republicans simply not taking these issues seriously. Democrats tried to invite another cybersecurity expert to testify here today who could have helped us better understand the threats to our country, like the Russian hacks. But the majority made up arbitrary and partisan reasons, in my opinion, to effectively block us. This decision shortchanges our members' ability to hear from the experts in this area. These games have to stop because these issues are just too serious to keep playing politics with our national security. Now, Democrats are trying to address these issues head on in a nonpartisan way. We have put forward three bills from Mr. Engel, Mr. McNearney, and Ms. Clark to help fix some of these problems. These are good bills that were introduced more than three months ago, and every day that goes by with no action is another day that the American people are at risk. Republicans, as I said before, should stop playing political games with national security because the risks are too great. And with that, I'd yield, like to yield uh, the time that I have left to uh, Ms. Clark and uh, Ms. Eshoo. I guess we'll split it evenly. We'll start, I uh, yield to uh, Ms. Clark. Uh, I first, I'd like to thank our ranking member, Mr. Pallone, for yielding his time to me and thank ranking member Doyle and Chairwoman Blackburn for holding this important hearing. And I welcome our uh, witnesses today for their expert testimony. I look forward to hearing from today's panelists. Many of my constituents in the 9th Congressional District of New York have voiced their concerns on cybersecurity and have asked that I and my colleagues uh, what we can do to lessen their vulnerability to cyber attacks, which is why I introduced the Cybersecurity Responsibility Act of 2017. The Cybersecurity Responsibility Act of 2017 calls on the Federal Communications Commission to take an active role in protecting communications networks by carefully arranging, organizing, and supervising cybersecurity risks to prevent cyber attacks. As technology continues to develop and grow, so must our rules and regulations on internet safety. It is our duty not only as members of Congress, but as members of the committee to protect Americans against cyber attacks by ensuring that there are sufficient rules in place. With that, Mr. Chairman, I, I yield back to you. And I yield, the, I yield the remaining of the time to Ms. Esch. Uh, I thank the ranking member and I thank all the witnesses. Uh, some of you have been here before, welcome back. And to those who haven't, welcome. Um, it, it's been said, but it needs to be restated. Um, Cybersecurity, I think, is really one of the most uh, pressing uh, national security issues, uh, challenges for our country. Almost everything that we do here in Congress relative to cybersecurity is after there has been a breach. And I think that we need to really uh, drill down on, um, uh, on prevention. Uh, uh, I have spoken to uh, countless people in, Sil in my Silicon Valley district. Almost to a person, they tell me that we need to uh, concentrate on prevention. Up to 90% of the breaches, both government and uh, private sector, and 95% of this is private sector, 5% is the federal government, as important as it is, uh, say that there are two pillars to this. One is um, uh, cyber hygiene, and the other is consistent security management. Uh, so I'm shortly going to be introducing legislation that reflects that. I think that NIST can set the standards, and I think that uh, uh, companies uh, uh, should have a, a set of good housekeeping uh, uh, a seal of approval, and that uh, as important it is, is to take steps after something has happened, I think that we need to start focusing on prevention. So uh, we'll talk more about it during the, uh, uh, with our um, uh, distinguished panel, but I want to thank the uh, ranking member for allowing me to, uh, giving me some time uh, to make this uh, brief statement. Thank you. Gentlelady yells back, the gentleman yells back, and this concludes our opening statements. I will remind all members that their opening statements will be made a part of the, the record. And we do thank our witnesses for being here with us today. We are going to give each of you the opportunity to make a five-minute open opening statement. And our witnesses, Mr. Bill Wright, 
who is the Director of Government Affairs and Senior Policy Counsel. And we welcome you, Mr. Amit Yoran, who is the Chairman and CEO of Tenable. Uh, Ms. Kirsten Todd, who is the Managing Partner at Liberty Group Ventures and a resident scholar at the University of Pittsburgh, I guess you're celebrating too, Institute for Cyber Law, Policy, and Security, and Mr. Charles Clancy, who is the Director and Professor at Home Center for National Security and Technology at Virginia Tech. So we appreciate that you are each here. We will begin, uh, Mr. Wright, with you. You're recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. Chairman Blackburn, Ranking Member Doyle, uh, members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, the cyber threats that we face today and every day are growing both in numbers and in sophistication. Uh, as the chairman pointed out in her opening statement, cyberspace truly is the battlefield for the 21st century. And while global ransomware attacks and destructive malware attacks tend to steal the headlines, it's other, uh, it's other threats, threats to mobile, threats to wireless, threats to IoT that are quickly gaining prominence. And no wonder. Today, more than half of the world's web traffic originates from mobile phones, and nearly half of the people on the planet own a smartphone today. But I think calling a phone doesn't quite do this justice. This isn't a phone. It's a powerful, connected, handheld computer. And from time to time, you can use it to call your wife. We need to start viewing these as computers, and we need to protect them as computers. Our web searches, our banking, our personal health information is all being transmitted and stored on mobile devices. Our smartphones are becoming an extension of ourselves and our identity. We are also seeing a blurring of the lines between work-issued devices and personal devices. Employees can and often expect to be able to work from anywhere. Workers can unwittingly introduce virus into an entire network system from a single download of a malicious app. IT security is no longer about just protecting the perimeter from attack because that perimeter now covers the entire planet. As we all rush and rush to connect more and more devices to the internet, we will undoubtedly improve our lives in many, many ways, but we will also be greatly increasing the attack surface. Last year's Mirai botnet DDoS attack was a sobering wake-up call for how powerful IoT-based botnet could be. And it was also a chilling reminder for what could happen if those botmasters had trained their sites elsewhere, say, on an industrial control system. Attackers are continuing to evolve their criminal tools and getting better at avoiding detection and obfuscating their actions. The incentives for criminals is very strong. Cybercrime is more lucrative than ever. There's very little risk in getting caught, and the underground cybercrime marketplace is booming, allowing even an art history major to conduct highly sophisticated cyber attacks by renting crime as a service by the hour or buying ransomware toolkits or mobile banking Trojans. Mobile device manufacturers, particularly Apple, have done a pretty good job at putting security into their products and keeping malicious apps out of their stores. Android also has made some great strides over the last year. However, the very attributes that make mobile phones so attractive to consumers also make them a very tempting target for cyber criminals. Because unlike your desktop computer, your mobile device is always active, always receiving, and used for every aspect of your life. Increasingly, smartphones are used for authentication purposes, various online accounts. A hacker only needs to steal or access your mobile device to get past all the other defenses that have been set up on the network side. Unfortunately, the public's attitude towards securing their devices has not kept pace with the potential threat. More than a quarter of smartphone users do not even use the most basic security feature, a screen lock, let alone applying timely software updates. And the criminals are following their victims onto these new platforms. Over the last few years, we've seen a dramatic rise in malicious activity related to mobile devices. 
uh, uh, driven by cyber criminals using tried and true methods to monetize attacks such as premium text messages, click fraud, and ransomware. Last year, Symantec detected more than 18 million mobile threats, an increase in 105 percent from the prior year. This trend will only be exacerbated over the next few years when tens of billions of connected devices are added to the Internet. Cyber criminals are only bound by their own imagination, and if there is a way to steal valuable data and monetize it, they will find it. As this subcommittee knows, we face significant challenges in our efforts to secure wireless networks and mobile devices, and while there remains much work to be done, we have made some progress in some areas. Uh, for instance, how we share threat information and when we share threat information with our, uh, with our government partners. At Symantec, we're committed to improving online security across the globe, including wireless and mobile security, and we'll continue to work collaboratively with our customers, industry, and governments to do so. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and happy to answer any questions. I thank you for the testimony. Mr. Yaran, you're recognized for five minutes. Chairman Blackburn, uh, Chairman Blackburn, Ranking Member Doyle, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today in what promises to be the most exciting hearing of the day. <laughs> I, I'm Chairman and CEO of Tenable, the world's most widely deployed vulnerability management solution, including in the federal government, where the majority of government agencies use our technology to assess and manage their cyber risk. It's important to put mobility and wireless in the context of modern computing enterprise uh, environments which are dynamic and borderless and virtually unlimited in connectivity. Mobile devices, wireless networks, transient user populations, cloud-based infrastructure, web applications, and the shift to DevOps go hand in glove with the Internet of Things in, our computing, in invading our computing environments. Today's complex mix of compute platforms and applications combine to represent the modern attack surface, where the assets themselves and their associated vulnerabilities are constantly expanding, contracting, and evolving, almost like a living organism, creating gaps in overall system understanding, security coverage, and resulting in underestimated exposure. Therefore, it's important that any approach to cybersecurity for mobile devices or wireless networks not be done in isolation, but rather viewed as part of a holistic ecosystem. In over 20 years practicing information security, the following axiom proves true time and again. You cannot secure what you don't know about. There are elements, if there are elements of your computing environment that are invisible or unknown to you, chances are that they represent unaccounted for risk. Both the NIST cybersecurity framework and DHS's continuous diagnostics and mitigation program call for identifying assets and vulnerabilities as the first step in cybersecurity. Identifying assets, not just once, but continually, is foundation to assessing risk and developing effective security programs. My written testimony includes policy recommendations, a few of which I'll highlight. First, we need a bold new cyber workforce strategy that develops and advances the ranks of all people from different walks of life. Only through increased inclusion and diversity in perspective and thought can our industry achieve the greater creativity, innovation, and develop new solutions to our most vexing challenges. At Tenable, we've implemented a Rooney Rule to set an example of greater diversity in our leadership ranks. I do want to state, however, that our efforts to expand the workforce will inevitably fall short of the insatiable demand for cyber talent, and we have to prepare for that with a complementary focus on technology and automation. Second, the government should encourage the private sector companies to continually and fully assess their cybersecurity risk just as the federal agencies will be doing and many regulatory requirements and best practices already mandate. Today, all organizations are part of a global ecosystem with a cyber hygiene responsibility to one another. Simple malware like WannaCry demonstrated what a very crippling cyber attack might do. The infection was spread company to company, many of which simply failed to adequately assess their cyber risk and act accordingly. Third, the federal government should continue to promote the NIST cybersecurity framework, which according to Gartner will be adopted by 50% of organizations by 2020. In closing, I want to emphasize the importance of taking an agile, continuous, and holistic approach to cybersecurity and technology policy. As we all know, IT is changing quickly across so many different dimensions. 
Prudence would have us look at mobile devices, wireless networks, and other technologies gaining great adoption in the broader context of our IT environments rather than in isolation. I'd like to thank Chairman Blackburn, Ranking Member Doyle, and all the members of the subcommittee for their attention to this important issue. And I'll be happy to respond to your questions. Uh, thank the gentleman. He yells back. And Dr. Clancy, you're recognized for five minutes. Um, thank you, Chairman Blackburn, uh, Ranking Member Doyle, and members of the subcommittee. Um, I think that uh, you've heard a lot about the threats that we face in the wireless uh, security space. Oh. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chairman Blackburn, Ranking Member Doyle, and, and, and subcommittee members. Um, I think we can all agree that there are, are major vulnerabilities uh, in the larger ecosystem of wireless security uh, that, that we have reason to be concerned about. Um, I'd like to focus my opening remarks a bit on the, the wireless infrastructure that underpins uh, those networks. Um, over the last decade, we've seen a fundamental shift of the DNA of the Internet, from uh, the Internet that connected uh, stationary computers to fixed server infrastructure uh, to one uh, that is the social mobile Internet. Uh, it is, is ubiquitous mobile broadband uh, that connects smartphones uh, and users to social media uh, and, and the Internet as a whole. Um, this has, again, fundamentally changed the makeup of the traffic on the Internet and the nature of the cybersecurity threat to the Internet. Over the next decade, we will see another uh, titanic shift of, of, the, of the Internet uh, with the so-called Internet of Things, uh, which has been referred to uh, uh, as, uh, by several others uh, so far. But the idea here is, is that we could see an increase of, of 20 billion devices connected to the Internet. Um, again, another fundamental titanic shift of the DNA of the Internet. Um, the wireless industry is working aggressively to address uh, the needs of, of IoT with uh, 5G wireless technology. Um, and is seeking to make sure that there are security uh, components that are built into the infrastructure to address those needs. Um, if you look at our cellular infrastructure today, um, the majority of us have uh, 4G LTE coverage. And 4G LTE learned from the mistakes of 3G, which learned from the mistakes of 2G, which learned from the mistakes of 1G, uh, and for the most part has the needed building blocks to develop and manage a secure wireless uh, mobile broadband infrastructure. Uh, the key challenge we have, though, is that uh, while 4G LTE is ubiquitously deployed, uh, we still have 2G and 3G uh, infrastructure that's operating, and much of the rest of the world has 2G and 3G infrastructure operating that remains vulnerable to a wide range of, of different attacks. And in particular, in the last, uh, last 12 months, we've seen uh, press around uh, IMSI catchers, or so-called uh, stingrays, uh, that are able to compromise user privacy. Uh, and the SS7 attacks that uh, were able to uh, uh, impact user privacy as well. Uh, and the big challenge is not that 4G LTE is insecure, it's just that uh, we still have this legacy 2G infrastructure deployed that remains insecure. Um, additionally, we have unlicensed bands. Uh, unlicensed technology, wireless technology, uh, fueled uh, innovation over the last decade or two. Right? Wi-Fi fundamentally transformed uh, many aspects of how we connect to the Internet and how Internet is available to us. Um, however, uh, in the early days of, of Wi-Fi, there were rampant security vulnerabilities. Uh, my PhD dissertation was studying those vulnerabilities and, and looking to address them in the standards that ultimately became WPPA and, and WPA2, uh, which ultimately shored up many of those vulnerabilities. And while home users and residential Wi-Fi networks are, uh, for the most part, secure through deployment of these new technologies, um, hotspots uh, uh, at everywhere from, from uh, your coffee shop to airplanes uh, remain insecure and are vulnerable to attacks that we've known about for, for two decades. Um, so that remains, I think, a challenge as we look at, at the wireless ecosystem as a whole. Um, third, I would look at, at the services that operate over these networks. Right? We have a very complex tapestry of uh, uh, members of this ecosystem. We have the device manufacturers, we have the operating system vendors, we have the people who write and, and develop apps that, that run on these systems. We have the cellular operators, we have the OEMs who build equipment for the cellular operators, we have the cloud providers, and we have the media and service uh, entities that, that sit over top of all of it. Um, and each one of these different groups has a different regulatory focal point within the U.S. government, whether it be the Federal Communications Commission or the Federal Trade Commission or DHS. Uh, and this creates a, a very complex uh, uh, ecosystem uh, when seeking to achieve cybersecurity because no one entity across that entire uh, continuum has uh, enough control of the ecosystem uh, to achieve unilateral security. 
Um, so as a result, I think it's imperative that we look at uh, as cybersecurity as a partnership where we need uh, stakeholders across all the, both government and industry, to be working together on, uh, on developing solutions and deploying uh, those solutions. Um, and lastly, as a, as a member of the academic community, uh, I, I will uh, reinforce the points that have been, been made earlier around workforce. Um, there are over a million cybersecurity jobs here in the United States, of which 31% are vacant. Uh, the number of new jobs in cybersecurity each year that, that become open uh, exceeds the total volume of computer scientists graduating across the entire United States. Uh, so we need to think more broadly about how we fill these cybersecurity gaps, and we need to think of cybersecurity not just as a, a sub-discipline of, of computer oh. science, but something that's fundamentally intrinsic to, to technology overall. And with that, uh, I will uh, uh, thank the, uh, the, the chairman and uh, <laughs> conclude my remarks. The gentleman yells back, and we thank you. Ms. Todd, you're recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Blackburn and Ranking Member Doyle and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to present my testimony on the promotion of security in wireless technology. I'm currently the managing partner of Liberty Group Ventures and a resident scholar in Washington, D.C. at the University of Pittsburgh Institute for Cyber Law, Policy, and Security. I also serve on the Federal Advisory Board of Lookout Incorporated and most recently served from March 2016 to March 2017 as the Executive Director of the Presidential Commission on Enhancing National Cybersecurity. This commission uh, was bipartisan, independent, and was charged with developing actionable recommendations for growing and securing the digital economy, as well as for creating a roadmap for the incoming administration. I appreciate this subcommittee's awareness of the need to focus on the security of wireless and mobile technology. In a world where first to market overrides secure to market, and every enterprise is seeking to make operations move more quickly and be more convenient, Addressing the security of these innovations is critical and absolutely necessary. In response to the questions posed by this hearing, my testimony will primarily focus on mobile security and addressing the growing threat around interdependencies and IoT. Mobile devices are an attack vector that cannot be ignored, and they are increasingly targeted for access to sensitive information or financial gain, as we've heard uh, thoughtfully from our other uh, panelists. But mobility should not be at odds with security, and the reality is that cloud and mobile adoption in the enterprise is just beginning. Mobile devices are part of every supply chain in, our, in your home and in your office. And mobile devices have become much more than communications devices. They are the access point to our work and our personal lives. Additionally, with the rise of two-factor authentication, an important step in ensuring security, but not the ultimate solution, the smartphone has become an even, even more important than the password. A compromised device could hand over to an attacker an authentication code and thus, and thus access to an individual's most personal information, as well as any work-related sensitive information. All mobile products have latent security vulnerabilities that could be exploited by bad actors, and many users ignore security policies and download apps from unofficial sources. According to a recent Poneman study, 67% of the Global 2000 reported that a data breach occurred as a result of employees using mobile devices to access the company's sensitive and confidential information. Last summer, Lookout and Citizen Lab detec detected the Pegasus spyware. Pegasus took advantage of three zero-day vulnerabilities in the iOS devices to take complete control of a device. The attack was capable of getting messages, calls, emails, logs, et cetera, from apps, including FaceTime, Facebook, WhatsApp, Viber, Skype, Gmail, and others. This threat represents the first time anyone has seen a remote jailbreak of an Apple device in the wild and shows us that highly resourced actors see the mobile platform as a fertile target for gathering information. Historically, government agencies have been restrictive about the use of mobile devices in the workplace, perhaps because agencies now recognize that mobility is happening with or without their permission. We are beginning to see a shift towards prioritizing mobili mobility initiatives in the federal government. The bottom line is that smartphones are essentially a supercomputer, as my colleague Mr. Wright noted, and today most have absolutely no security software on them. Mandates or policies stipulating that mobile devices must have an agent on the device that does predictive analytics should be considered. I would like to take this opportunity to commend John Ramsey, the CISO of the U.S. House of Representatives, for his focus and recent action on mobile security. This example is one where Congress is ahead of the executive branch in implementing a cybersecurity best practice. And I encourage this committee, perhaps in collaboration with the House Homeland Security Committee, to hold a hearing on and to examine how federal agencies can do a better job to defend against mobile security risks and to take a page from the U.S. House of Representatives. 
Our interconnections and interdependencies are becoming more complex and now extend well beyond critical infrastructure. These interconnections reduce the importance of the critical infrastructure label because by association, all dependencies may be critical, as we saw with the Dine Mirai attack last fall. The proliferation of IoT devices is a growing challenge, and for the purpose of this hearing, I offer the automobiles as an example of interconnected devices. A Tesla is really a giant phone and battery on wheels. The base technology for connected cars originates from the smartphone revolution, and IoT and all of the technology that goes into connected cars, for example, is based on open source code that is genetically related to smartphones. We need to recognize that neither the government nor the private sector can capably protect systems and networks without close and extensive cooperation. The mobile environment only adds to the challenge and urgency to develop an approach that emphasizes pre-event collaboration, which I describe in my written testimony, to more effectively manage our collective cybersecurity risk. As Representative Eshoo noted, government does incident response well, but we need to be doing more to focus on prevention and collaboration before an event actually occurs. Information sharing is a byproduct, byproduct of trust that develops through that type of collaboration. We now recognize mobile security as one of the greatest risks affecting all enterprises, and we therefore need to treat mobile devices as an endpoint security, prior, an endpoint priority, equal to, if not more important than traditional endpoints, such as desktops and laptops. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in front of you today. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful testimony, zipping right through it. And so we will begin with questions. And I will yield myself five minutes and begin the questions. Mr. Wright, I'm going to start right there uh, with you. We know, and you all have referenced some of the public-private partnership, the government-industry partnerships that have moved forward and attempted to look at best practices in the mobile cyberspace uh, NIST. We've mentioned that a couple of times, their framework and CTIA's cyber working group. So is standard setting enough, is best practices enough, or do we still need to have a statutory legislative solution? Well, I think it may be a little early to tell. Microphone. Oh, no problem. Uh, I think it might be a little early to tell right now, um, following some of the NIST and cybersecurity framework guidelines, I think is, is working. I think there are a lot of private sector um, that are currently adopting part of the executive order. Um, it's going to get more of the government using uh, uh, the uh, NIST cybersecurity framework. Um, but there's a lot of other cooperation going on between public and private sector <coughs> as well. Um, I think if WannaCry had happened two years ago, it would have been a much different story. Today, this time, you had government and the private sector coming together immediately within hours of the outbreak starting, sharing information, sharing, sharing indicators of compromise, um, and you got, ended up getting sort of a much, much better result. Um, at Symantec, I know we take our government and our private sector um, relationships very seriously, most uh, oftentimes focused on law enforcement. Um, but that, that sort of uh, private sector industry and government um, uh, partnering, I think, really is the, the key to this. There is no government around that's going to be able to uh, fight this, um, uh, this problem alone, and there certainly is no private company that's okay. going to be able to fight this alone. Anyone else want to add something, Ms. Todd? If I may, so I had the uh, privilege of working with NIST on the development of the cybersecurity framework. And one of the reasons why it continues to be so successful is it was developed by industry for industry. And so then there is a, a, an approach that industry is then allowed to take to understand how to manage its risks. And I think one of the um, strong points to the executive order that President Trump released was the focus on risk management. And I think when you're looking for industry and government to come together, having that focus on risk management from a collaboration perspective helps to develop those standards. What we uh, concluded in the commission report was that private and public sector, you sh they should work together. When they don't work together, we should create incentives. And when those incentives don't work, then we should interfere uh, with regulation and other types of uh, official standards. OK. Anyone else? Dr. Clancy, let me ask you, uh, you talked a little bit about the Internet of Things and the connected devices. And of course, we have a forum going on today, a showcase, uh, dealing with some of that. I want you to expand a little bit on the challenges of securing the IoT devices, especially the wearable 
technologies and what would be some of the consequences of our failing to adequately secure IoT devices if you've got 20 billion such devices connected uh, to the internet in a few years and what do you see that framework that those challenges? I think that IoT represents a breadth of different um, different products and technologies. You have your internet connected salt. Right. Shelter. Let's focus on the wearable on, technologies. On one end. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so with respect to wearable, I think some of the chief concerns are, are privacy of individual users, and um, we want to make sure that data that is collected from those devices and ingested into the cloud and, and used as part of. Uh, uh, whether it's some health app or, or, or some other um, uh, uh, service to consumers, uh, that that data remains private and isn't used to compromise the privacy of, of, the, of the consumers that use that information. I think some of the challenges we have uh, are that um, uh, m much of the devices are manufactured overseas. Uh, we have supply chain challenges and code quality challenges yeah. with the One software way. that is, is in those devices. Um, and that results in... Um, uh, devices that we, we don't know if, if uh, are, are robust or not. Uh, and many times they connect uh, through unlicensed Wi-Fi devices and there's no um, strong credentials or authentication that can be used to um, uh, provide real governance over those devices. Uh, there's no way to push out software updates, for example, um, in a deterministic way if there are vulnerabilities that are discovered. So I, I think those are some of the challenges that we face, in, in the, particularly in the, in the wearable space of IoT. Thank you. Um, before I yield back my time, I will, uh, my colleagues across the aisle have mentioned Russia a couple of times, and I would just like to highlight that we have in times past tried to raise Russia, and our concerns there is an issue, and indeed with uh, items manufactured offshore, I think Huawei, we did a hearing on cyber and Huawei and uh, concerns with Russia. And then even in the 2012 presidential, we, Mr. Romney raised Russia as a concern. I would also highlight with my colleagues, we have privacy and data security legislation we would love to move forward on. We look forward to having them join us in working on these issues. And with that, I yield back my time and recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so as, as the threats we face continue to evolve and grow, it seems that we not, e not only need to step up our basic practices of cyber hygiene and best practices, but we need to look to the future. And the witnesses, all of you in your testimony, refer to the shortfall in the workforce for cybersecurity positions. Uh, I know that DARPA in 2016 had the Cyber Grand Challenge. Uh, and they challenged researchers to create autonomous systems that could defend against cyber attacks. Uh, actually, a team from Carnegie Mellon won that challenge, a, a victory that we're proud of in Pittsburgh. But I'm curious, how does the panel see autonomous defensive systems addressing this escalation in threats in our workforce shortfalls? And y y we can just start at, uh, at, at Mr. Wright and, and go down. Please. Uh, certainly, uh, certainly the shortage in uh, qualified cyber, cyber personnel is a problem today. It's going to be a problem in the future. Um, I think the more that we can move toward autonomous defenses, uh, the better off we are going to be. I don't think the technology is there today, but it's getting better every day. Um, that type of innovation, I know, is a huge focus for not just for Symantec, but for other uh, vendors as well. Thank you. Mr. Yorn? I think there's great promise and, and certainly uh, progress being made uh, in autonomous defenses, uh, a lot of work going on in the cyber domain around artificial intelligence. From my perspective, the key to success is to scale the talent that we have asymmetrically. Part of that would be through autonomous defense, part of it would be through other technologies which provide the limited number of network defenders to cover more ground. I would, I would agree with that. I think uh, the major opportunity with autonomous defense is to act as a force multiplier for those human analysts who ultimately are making decisions about what defenses to deploy and, and how to manage them. Um, we're seeing a, an, a renaissance of artificial intelligence right now with deep learning and early research uh, applying that to cybersecurity looks very, very promising, uh, but that, won't, uh, that, that will help make existing uh, analysts and cyber defenders more efficient, uh, but they will always still need to be part of the equation. Sure. 
I'd like to just approach it from a little bit of a different perspective in the sense that from the workforce, workforce, we look at the fact, what we heard on the commission particularly, is that there are two issues. The current workforce that we have isn't trained effectively for the skill sets that are needed, and we also need to be bringing in additional individuals into the workforce. But this needs to happen while automation, AI, big data, machine learning are all being developed. And so what we have to understand is that the culture of cybersecurity that, that is being created covers everything and arguably everybody is a part of the cyber workforce. So while developing that workforce, we're also being able to invest in the innovation that can contribute to the autonomous defense that you mentioned. Thank you. Let me ask the panel this also. You know, as we look to the range of threats by government, industry, institution, to, to individuals, uh, we, we acknowledge we all have a shared responsibility to defend and protect this infrastructure. So uh, what role do you think ISPs can play in mitigating cyber threats, whether it be a botnet, malware, or some other threat? Do you, do you think federal agencies should have more authority to mandate either concrete steps or risk mitigation frameworks to ensure that these companies take su sufficient steps to protect these networks if they're not doing it on their own? And for anyone on the panel. Sounds like a dangerous question. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll take a, a stab at it. Um, I, I think that there's an opportunity for service providers to differentiate themselves based on security service levels. And we've seen uh, a number of service providers take a very proactive approach to their security programs and offer security services and protective services as part of these packages and using it as a differentiation. When you get uh, to a point of mandating security, I think you're on a very slippery slope and, and potentially dangerous uh, scenario where the service providers don't necessarily own the applications, uh, they don't understand the ways the systems are being used and what impact might occur if they choose to block certain types of, of traffic or not. So um, there is merit in further investigating uh, the concept. I just think it should be done very cautiously. And I just would like to add, um, from the executive order, this was one of the key issues that was raised, and it was also something that created a lot of initial tension with the commission to understand whose role, who is responsible for what. To this, as uh, Zamit said, I mean, this is this is dangerous territory, and there was a lot of uh, discussion and debate. But what the executive order lays out, and I think what industry has said, is essentially we need to come together to understand where the responsibilities lie and how to create a roadmap for moving forward. This is clearly a, an issue for collaboration between industry and government. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Mr. Lance for five minutes. Uh, thank you. I promise no dangerous questions, and uh, you've all answered them very beautifully and very adeptly in my judgment. Um, Dr. Clancy, you mentioned in your testimony that 5G technologies have the opportunity to close current cybersecurity gaps. Can you please expand on what these cybersecurity gaps are and how the industry's 5G innovations can help close the gaps? I think that as you look at the shift, the technology shift that's happened as we move from the, the 3G and 2G core network infrastructure to the 4G core network infrastructure, we've moved away from the old circuit switch technology and into all IP-based uh, cell phone uh, backhaul and, and backbone. Um, this is creating a, a range of new opportunities for, for new technologies and new service providing, uh, uh, new services that can be provided through this infrastructure. Um, and it also exposes much of that cellular infrastructure to the same sorts of risks that you face on the Internet. Before we had a closed circuit switch network that was isolated from the Internet, now the barrier between the Internet and the cell phone core infrastructure begins to get blurry because of the structure of, of the 4G infrastructure. Um, 5G actually blurs the line even further uh, with technologies like edge computing, um, a cloud-based radio access network technology. Um, however, the, uh, these are new tools in the toolbox uh, that could be used to construct uh, a, a better set of layered cyber defenses on behalf of subscribers, uh, but the, we still haven't yet, uh, from a research and standards perspective, uh, really figured out how all of that will fit together. Uh, thank you. Mr. Yuren, as we saw with the attack last year, unsecured Internet of Things devices can pose a threat to the other areas of the Internet ecosystem. With billions of IoT devices expected to come to market in the coming years, it is essential that this vulnerability 
be addressed. Um, do you see the NIST cybersecurity framework as the best approach to address Internet of Things security? Uh, I think the NIST cybersecurity framework is probably the best place to begin the dialogue around Internet of Things security. Uh, at the end of the day, we have to take the, a holistic approach to cybersecurity. We can't look at mobile devices independently. We can't look at wireless networks independently or Internet of Things independently. These things are completely intertwined. Um, Internet of Things most frequently rely on wireless networks for their communication, so they have to be looked at. Uh, and I think the most important thing from my perspective that the cybersecurity framework uh, pushed toward was taking a risk-based approach uh, because no use of technology is risk-free. So understanding it from a risk perspective is really helpful. Would anyone else on the panel like to comment? Just a quick comment. That's one of the issues that was brought up also in the executive order and from the commission, which is to bring together, as uh, Amit said, bringing together industry and government based off of the platform. So I think there is motion already in place at NIST to, to move forward with this, to be able to develop a set of standards that industry creates for itself. Uh, I couldn't agree with that more in that um, industry is often ahead of us in government and we want to work in a cooperative way, but m my belief based upon the last 20 years is that we are innovative because of uh, the way we have approached this and certainly we want the United States to continue to be the innovative center of the world regarding these matters. I, I represent a district uh, that is uh, very heavily involved in, in technology and in the internet and we want that to continue. We don't want to lose leadership to uh, some other place uh, ar around the globe. Thank you, uh, Chair, and I yield back a minute. And we'll take it, and Mr. McNerney, five minutes. I thank the, the Chairwoman. Um, Ms. Todd, in your written testimony, you talk about the world where first to market overrides secure to market. Um, would you agree that the, we are currently faced with a market failure since those who buy and sell uh, insecure devices do not have to bear the full cost of those devices? So I think you've asked a question that's really at the crux of the IoT debate um, because as long as we're pushing out innovation without any security guidelines or boundaries, we're in this second phase. A, a colleague of Mr. Wright's at Symantec was part of the NSTAC report who talked about this first 18-month window that we've passed on the proliferation of IoT devices. And where we are now is that we, we heard from, in one of our commission hearings, uh, the CIO of Intel who said we want regulations and standards around IoT devices because we can't possibly compete in this realm where you've got small businesses pushing out the innovation. So we have to think thoughtfully about incentives, penalties, and being able to truly develop secure by design, which is unfortunately becoming one of those terms that's losing its meaning because it's such a common term, but the idea of building security in and having to build software and hardware to certain standards around security has to be a priority right now with, as we've heard all of the statistics, the proliferation of IoT devices that is only going to increase. Well, you sort of answered my follow-up question already, um, which was, uh, I proposed legislation that would require cybersecurity standards to be developed for the devices and uh, for the devices to be certified to meet those standards. Would that help decrease the threat? So I think it actually connects back to an earlier question, which is how do we to build out the IoT standards? And I, I would offer that where we have seen such, such success with the NIST framework is the fact that industry and government have worked together. And so really looking at that collaboration first and foremost, and then being able to inform any legislation. This, I think the sequence of that is important because we learn from what government, what industry has done, and we have to come together to then develop the standards um, that you reference. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Wright, Semantics Internet Security Threat Report points to a growing number of attacks on IoT devices. Uh, would requiring the IoT devices to meet baseline cybersecurity standards help decrease that threat? Is your microphone on? Uh, it certainly would be a, uh, um, something to look into. I also agree that the NIST cybersecurity framework is a good place to begin a lot of those discussions. Um, IoT is a little bit strange. The, the, the consumer isn't really playing the role of demanding secure products at this point. Some of that could be around awareness. 36% um, of uh, the devices that are being manufactured and pushed out there right now have a default password of admin. 
Um, yeah. These are very, some of these are very simple fixes. Um, I think when the consumers are armed and aware of the dangers, they have a better chance of driving some of those markets. Good. Well, all of the WannaCry ransomware attack was not the result of insecure IT devices. I'm curious about what lessons we can apply from uh, the attack to IoT device security. How susceptible are IoT devices to ransomware attacks? So we've seen some, um, some preliminary, um, um, more like research uh, around uh, IoT. I know that smart, uh, uh, um, we did a research project where a smart TV was hacked and ransomware. Um, like I said earlier in my testimony, um, criminals are looking for ways to monetize these attacks. Um, they are only bound by their imagination, and it is a matter of time uh, before they're able to uh, figure out how to monetize um, um, ransomware attacks on uh, devices, on uh, IoT devices. Well, are there a way that uh, IoT security uh, or insecurity could result in physical harm? Certainly. Um, IoT devices that are, um, uh, that are infected um, can have real-world consequences, absolutely. And uh, how come, how, just to explain, how, how come it's difficult to patch IoT devices? Well, a lot of times these are being shipped out without any possibility of, uh, of sending out firmware um, changes. In fact, most of them cannot receive uh, patches or updates. So um, could we, in your opinion, rely on voluntary IoT device security uh, from the manufacturers? Um, well, I think that's, I, I, I do think this needs to be sort of a consensus-driven uh, standard. We need to have private sector involved. We need to have government involved and to sort of find that, find that middle ground. Otherwise, it's not going, to, not going to work. I will point out one thing. The, uh, the Mirai botnet that we're discussing today, those devices were not manufactured in the U.S., but rather they, the vast majority of them were manufactured um, overseas, specifically in China. Okay, uh, before I yield, I just want to say I appreciate Ms. Todd's remark that government does respond well but needs to do prevention better. Thank you. I yield back. Mr. Shimkus, you're recognized. For thank you, Madam Chairman. This was a, uh, an excellent hearing. I do want to thank you all for coming. Um, this is like an arms race. And the reason why I've always enjoyed this committee is that you know technology moves faster than we can regulate, hence it's very successful. Um, <laughs> well, and that's part of this debate. I mean, do we do federal standards and really almost slow up the ability for expansion and new applications? Or, and so that's why I like I think most people are talking about consensus-based working with the sector because um, if we don't, we'll trip over ourselves and we'll slow applications, we'll slow development, and that's why I think you see us kind of doing this little kabuki dance between the sides um, because it, it is a, it's just a very exciting, but there's a lot of dangers out there and people are going to take, as was just said, you, know, you can't control what the bad actors are going to try to do to get access. But I also appreciated the comment that for a, a manufacturer or a provider, um, they can, having secure information is marketable and should be, uh, they could market it as a premium for the services they're providing. And I think we got some businesses here that all, that wrap around this. I think the average individual um, we, we understand having a security office in a corporate setting and probably a sub under the security is data security and, and obviously, um, you know, uh, this uh, wireless technology and all these things as, as a subsection. So when we hire, when you're looking for a computer programmer to go in cyber, in the cyber world, what, what, what is a new engineering... Uh, computer programmer, what are they going to be doing? I'm sure there's a plethora of things, but I mean, they're just going to be sitting in the screen watching interactions and trying to pick out uh, and identify an attack. I mean, we've all been in, in I've been in nuclear, uh, uh, you know, uh, power plants. I've been in data centers. I've been with screens all over the place. Is, is that what they're doing? Is that what a computer programmer in cybersecurity ends up doing? Uh, Mr. Orn, you want to answer that? 
I'll, I'll take a crack at it. Uh, in my experience, the, the best cybersecurity professionals are the ones that just show a tremendous amount of intellectual curiosity in what they're looking at. And sometimes it comes through formal uh, training and discipline, uh, and, and frequently it doesn't. Uh, it's usually not the, uh, the analyst who's sitting behind a screen watching logs go by and, and trying to pick and choose which one to dig into that's going to make the difference or that's going to uh, scale our industry. If, if I could, I, I think the comment that you made and the uh, congressman from California made are, I want to say, two, two sides of, of the same coin, but they point to this foundational question of, you know, is there a market failure and what can and should uh, Congress do about it? And, and uh, from my experience, I think it'd be hard to argue that a market, you, you know, we're not at a point of, of market failure. Anything from the, you know, the election to the hack that you see in every newspaper or news uh, distribution point, um, even real news uh, distribution point uh, uh, on a daily basis. The, in order for free markets to work, you have to have an educated populace and you have to have a high degree of transparency. And I think in the cyber domain, we, don't, we, we lack that transparency. There's a general lack of appreciation for what the threat environment looks like. There's, uh, there isn't a consistent understanding of what good cybersecurity looks like, what's working in our domain. Uh, there is a lack of transparency when uh, uh, breaches occur outside of ones that impact uh, PII, and so there isn't a common appreciation for what's not working, and, and also I think what's at stake and what's at risk in using various products. So I think that there is a role for uh, Congress to play around helping to raise awareness and create greater transparency. Let me go to just Dr. Clancy real quick because my time's running out. Um, when we travel, which we as members get a chance to do, we're visiting troops, we end, many times we we're asked to leave our computer at home and we're giving a little dinky one to, to be able to continue to communicate. How are we, how, how secure is the U.S. wireless system uh, versus places else around the world? I'd say the United States has, has the most secure wireless infrastructure in the world. Um, I think the fact that it, uh, the, the things that lead to insecurity in other countries' networks have to do with uh, deployment and use of old technology, um, a, a workforce that's managing those networks that is not aware of, of the latest threats, um, and the influence of, uh, of authoritarian regimes over state-owned telecom infrastructure providers in many of those countries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Ms. Matsui, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, for having this hearing, and I thank the witnesses for being here today. Wireless technology and connectedness of uh, data and information have huge potential to move us forward in a variety of industries. Ms. Tott, you mentioned in your testimony that you recently had blood work done and were told the only way you could access the results was by downloading an app on your smartphone. I see both potential for good and for danger in this situation. It may be much more convenient for you to receive your test results visually on your phone rather than via snail mail or fax or a phone call. This could result in you acting on that information in a more timely or consistent manner, potentially improving your health. However, that also means that your data is potentially vulnerable. We saw the risk with the recent malware attacks that brought down hospital systems Without access to the information that the doctors and nurses relied on to treat their patients, they could no longer do so effectively. Our healthcare system is uniquely at risk of attacks. Most professionals who go into the healthcare field, often including administrators, don't have a cybersecurity background. We need to work to ensure that our healthcare providers have the technological infrastructure and workforce to manage the complex data that they need to best serve patients. Last week, the Department of Health and Human Services released its Healthcare Industry Cybersecurity Task Force report. Among other things, the report recommended executive education about the importance of cybersecurity. Ms. Tott and any of the other witnesses, what recommendations do you have for developing cybersecurity leadership in industries such as healthcare? Thank you. Um, I'm now convinced, uh, given what the chairman said, that I was one of the 100 million that got my uh, health care records breached last year, but that's, <laughs> that's something else for me to figure out. 
Um, I think that what you ask is a great question in relation to also the other questions that have been posed around IoT and workforce. Because we tend to think of cybersecurity workforce as those with the engineering degrees. But what we have to understand in the workforce that we're creating is that everybody has to be educated on cybersecurity. This is not a, it's not an expertise. It crosses every enterprise. And arguably, I would think that um, human resources professionals, those who are hiring, have to have a baseline level, level of knowledge. The other issue is that when you are a manager, you have to be trained in cybersecurity mm -hmm. so that you know what you're doing, regardless of whether or not your function is cyber related. And I think enterprises need to be looking at cybersecurity education the way, as an onboarding process, the way they look at ethics and integrity and basic uh, company protocols and procedures. We have to be incorporating cybersecurity awareness and education from the ground up to create this culture. Uh, and I think that this is something as we move forward uh, to emphasize. The other issue that this is more of a technical response, but we talk about the education of end user awareness. From a technology perspective, while we are educating the consumers and the individuals and industries and enterprises, we also need to be thinking about moving security away from the end user mm. from an innovation perspective. Okay, um, thank you very much. And let me move on to Dr. Clancy. Dr. Clancy, according to one study, none of America's top 10 computer science programs as ranked the U.S. News and World Report in 2015 require graduates to take one cybersecurity course. Three of the top 10 programs didn't offer an elective in cybersecurity, but with the rise of cyber attacks and security breaches in our networks and the shortage of cybersecurity professionals, it is imperative that our students graduate with the coursework needed to be able to tackle security issues. Dr. Clancy, how can Congress encourage our colleges and universities to prepare students either through expanding courses, hiring more faculty, or other innovative solutions for careers in cybersecurity? So I think uh, the reason you, you may see that in some of the top-ranked programs is that the, the, the traditional academic uh, culture that cybersecurity is, is a buzzword uh, and is a, a fad. Um, and uh, myself and others in academia are working very hard to convince them otherwise that this is a fundamental problem that is going to be with us uh, indefinitely. Um, I think there are a number of programs that are very positively impacting this ecosystem to include NSA's Centers for Academic Excellence Program uh, and the CyberCorps Scholarship for Service Program. While cyber, uh, the CyberCorps program provides uh, scholarship money for students to pursue careers in, um, in government upon graduation, like a cyber ROTC program, uh, the uh, funding helps the university establish a platform that can educate students in cybersecurity who go into many different careers, not just into federal government. We saw that directly at Virginia Tech as, as part of our receipt of a cyber uh, core grant. I think more initiatives and further investment in programs like that is, is a great place to start. Okay, thank you, and I ran out of time. I yield back. Mr. Olson, you're recognized. I thank the chair and welcome to all four witnesses. Mr. Ron, thank you, sir, for your service to our country and our United States Army. West Point graduate. Heartfelt congratulations as well, because with a assist from Temple, for the first time in 15 years, your Navy beat my Army in football. Bravo, Zulu. Your testimony talks about an elastic attack surface that includes a growing number of information technology devices. Being a vice chairman of the Energy Subcommittee, I worry about cyber attacks on our power grid. December 23rd, 2015, 230,000 people in the Ukraine were without power for one to six hours. A cyber attack likely coming from Comrade Putin in Russia. It was very low tech. They simply remotely flipped some switches. What kind of advice does your company provide to critical infrastructure companies in our electric grid regarding how to best protect their systems from a cyber attack? Uh, thank you, Congressman. I think that's a, uh, an ongoing challenge. Um, as early as uh, uh, last night, the US uh, program issued additional uh, warning and guidance to uh, energy and critical infrastructure companies around the crash uh, override piece of malware, which is affecting power companies uh, around the world. Uh, from a security perspective, there's a great challenge in that industry in that the systems are incapable of being updated or uh, there's tremendous risk in updating those systems. 
which unlike our mobile phones or desktop PCs, have a lifespan measured in, in decades. Uh, from a best practices perspective, uh, these organizations have historically left those critical networks in a standalone state, but increasingly they're interconnected. Uh, we offer technologies and other companies offer technology that, technologies that help monitor these networks uh, on a passive basis. So without introducing additional risk, additional packets, or probing those networks, you can see what they're vulnerable to and you can create a series of compensating controls to protect those systems from internet compromise. Also, you brought up artificial intelligence. And as a co-chair of the recently launched Artificial Intelligence Caucus, I believe it's important that we use cybersecurity technology to complement the work of the talented human brains that make this happen. Uh, we know that technology alone won't solve the cybersecurity issues we have, but can you elaborate on how leveraging this technology for a, the growing AI field will work, do you think? Cybersecurity in the AI field, or Mr. Wright? Dr. Clancy, Ms. Todd, <laughs> someone want to take that? It's not a bomb, not a grenade. I'm, I'm happy to, to take a stab at that. I think uh, the DARPA Cyber Grand Challenge that we saw last year is, a, is a, as an example of a first step in being able to accomplish that. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I think that, um, it, that, that AI will become uh, initially a tool that helps uh, uh, analysts do their job more effectively and s more scalably to deal with a growing threat and, and, a larger, and larger amounts of data. Um, there is uh, an AI renaissance that's happening, right? There are, are fundamental advancements that are happening that are um, completely changing the world of image processing and search that, that Google and others are leading. Um, and uh, I think there are many in the cybersecurity community that are hoping that those technologies can be applied to the cyber problem, uh, but that's still a, a, an early research area that, that many people are sort of feverishly working on right now in academia. Ms. Todd, you look like you're chomping the bit to comment. Am I reading that wrong? Oh. Just in support, I, I think that there's we need to be investing, obviously, in the innovation. I was on a panel with somebody who used to work at DARPA who essentially talked about the fact that there are functions that really aren't meant for humans and that our ability to um, automate and make those functions more capable through supercomputing will help our systems work more effectively. One final question for you, Ms. Yaron. We are seeing an explosion of free Wi-Fi hotspots all around the country. Whether they're at the corner coffee house, the Starbucks, the airport, the airplanes you mentioned, heck, the Mr. Car Wash right down the street from my house, my daughter and wife go there all the time, has a free high uh, hotspot just for the 20 minutes you're there. Um, do they offer unique challenges to safeguard? If so, what should be done on the network side as opposed to the user side? Well, I think the most important thing uh, is to recognize that whether you're going to a public hotspot or you get fooled into connecting to a rogue uh, hotspot or you're connected to a corporate network which is already compromised and, and frequently is, uh, the most important thing that you can do and that organizations can do is better assess the vulnerability and exposure of their systems and make sure that they're applying the latest patches and they don't fall victim. Uh, a vast majority of the attacks that we see come from well-known, well-established vulnerabilities to which patches are readily available. Good luck, Army. I yield back. <laughs> Ms. Dingle, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for doing this hearing and to all of the witnesses. There are so many questions. Cybersecurity is something that should concern all of us, and as somebody who has been hacked more than anybody would want to be, I can tell you it's a pain to have to change your password and switch to two-factor authentication and worry about personal information being compromised. I think what, and not even in what I prepared, what's really worrying me is some of the factoids that you have raised here today. I think one of the issues is training people. Even when you've got trained IT people and you go to them and you ask a question, ask John Podesta, myself have done this, should I do this? And they say, oh yes, and then it turns out not to be the right thing. I think I got one last night that I've now been burnt so much I was smart enough to wait and talk to somebody today. And I really worry about, as we start to talk about autonomous vehicles, as an example, if people don't, how are we going to make sure patches that need to occur, occur? And when they don't, even when we look at the healthcare, what happened on the healthcare system, there were simple patches available that users aren't using. How do you legislate that? I, th these are real issues. 
But for these five minutes, which are now down to three minutes, 45 seconds, let's talk about mobile phones, which as you said, uh, Mr. Wright, are basically supercomputers we have in our pockets. Our phones are always by our sides. We store our most intimate and personal details in them. And it's happening now and in the near future, people are gonna be locked out of their phones and in turn will be locked out of personal, social, financial information. That's a new experience for everyone. We're gonna see this high level of hysteria and we've gotta pay attention to it. So this question's for the entire panel. Ransomware is now available as a service, making it incredibly easy for criminals to carry out an attack. What can government do from a policy perspective to increase barriers to entry and the cost of carrying out ransomware attacks and do you think the threat of a ransomware attack on a mobile device will only continue to increase if the government doesn't do something? Any of the panel. Start out here. Um, starting with your last question, I, I, I think that mobile ransomware will probably increase no matter what is done. Um, again, the criminals follow the money. Um, and right now, your, uh, your your handheld computer uh, is where that money or where that data is. Um, when they can figure out uh, how to monetize locking up that phone or uh, encrypting that data on your phone enough to the point where uh, you will pay to get it back, and then in that case, mostly not get, get, the, uh, get the data back, they will exploit that. I don't think any of us are comfortable with the, the state of security on mobile phones, but I think a lot of progress has been made. A lot of lessons have been learned in the mobile, some have not, but a lot of lessons have been learned in the mobile domain from decades of, of mistakes and accidents in, in operating systems and in compute platforms from the, uh, the desktop uh, paradigm. So I'm uh, 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 confident that we'll see an increase in ransomware no matter what is done on mobile platforms given how attractive they are as a target. But I think the industry is making progress to make that more and more challenging over time. I think that if you, if you look at ransomware, it's leveraging the same vulnerabilities that uh, people have used to exploit mobile devices for, for the last decade. Um, so continued work to make sure patches are, are deployed and, and apps are updated is critical to closing the front door, if you will, to, to ransomware. I think other areas that are somewhat unique to ransomware have to do with educating users about the importance of backing up their data so that if they are a victim of ransomware attack, they're able to recover their data. Uh, many cellular providers offer free services to back up your data on your phone to the cloud, and, and consumers need to take advantage of that. Um, secondly, I think the, there's really the, the forensic and law enforcement side of being able to follow the money and be able to take down the ransomware networks, um, which is increasingly difficult with the, the rise of uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, uh, but that's perhaps a, a larger question. I think ransomware represents sometimes a little bit of the flavor of the day in that we have these problems that continue to evolve, but the solutions for them can, are the same. When we look at WannaCry, which was you know essentially not updating with patches that are there. So it's a lot of the cyber hygiene that we've talked about um, and the regular download. I think it's also important, um, you, you raise an interesting element to this, which it's often important to remember that uh, attacks and when we think when data is compromised or man manipulated it's not usually because there's some engineering expertise or genius it's really about opportunism and being able to access and exploit that opportunism and so that's why education backing up all of those very basic uh, uh, actions can really cover about 80 percent of the solution I had more questions but I'm out of time thank you madam chair and we'll give the opportunity to submit those questions in writing Mr. Johnson, you're recognized, five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, Mr. Yuran, uh, in, in your testimony, you note that there's a shortage of um, skilled labor in the cybersecurity workforce. Um, how acute is that shortage? Has it manifested itself in your company? Do you have a, a problem hiring those kind of people in, in your own business? Uh, it's uh, it, that's a great question. It's extremely competitive to hire experienced cybersecurity professionals. Um, you know, the compensation is great, and as they continue to gain experience, uh, you know, their expectations continue uh, to rise. From on the on the technical or the strategic side, because I mean, there's a there's a big difference between people that understand 
what cybersecurity is and those people that can get down to the ones and zeros and kind of do the, the technical wherewithal to find out who the bad guys are? I, I think there's really a, a shortage on, uh, on both fronts, which is why I think the, uh, the importance of Dr. Clancy's comments around the multidisciplinary approach to, uh, uh, to cybersecurity. What we found is in addition to compensation, there's, there's two other critical aspects to attracting and retaining cybersecurity talent. One is in providing them intellectually stimulating work. It's an exciting field, and if you don't give them exciting problems, uh, they'll go elsewhere to find them. And the other is to, in creating a culture that is, uh, that's dynamic and, and one that's enjoyable to be uh, part of. Okay. Um, do you think we have the same level of, uh, of expertise shortage um, and finding skilled workforce in, in government agencies or departments? Is, is it worse, the same? Uh, I don't know that I have uh, the data in front of me to comment whether it's, the worse, whether it's uh, worse uh, or the same. I do know that uh, a tr tremendous amount of expertise in the private sector uh, starts out getting its experience in uh, public service, which is costly to, uh, to uh, the government in terms of losing that talent, but I, I think it, makes a trem it provides tremendous value to the private sector in terms of uh, the level of maturity under an understanding of very sophisticated cyber threats. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Clancy, uh, what a name for uh, a topic like cybersecurity. Man, if your first name was Tom, you'd be. It actually yeah, is. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd consider <laughs> changing it if I were you. Uh, could, but no, 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 seriously, my name is Tom Clancy. Uh, okay, all right. Well, the real Tom Clancy, please stand up. I go okay. by my middle name, Charles. All right. uh, it, it causes too much confusion. <laughs> Uh, well, Dr. Clancy, how, how soon should we expect biometric tools to supplant the traditional pen and password uh, approach to device security? Uh, so, so biometrics have offered uh, a, a tremendous opportunity to fundamentally change how we authenticate people. Um, I think there are, there are still challenges. The, the joke in the biometrics community is that uh, if I'm using a fingerprint as my password, I can only change my password nine times before I run out of fingers. Mm -hmm. um, so there are, are there some, there's some challenges there. If, if, your, if your fingerprint data is compromised because it's stored in a database, uh, then your, your, your credential is sort of irrevocably lost uh, and you can't change it like you can change it. So in, in that regard then, in that vein, do you think uh, biometric tools are gonna make us more secure or, or are we gonna happen upon the same kinds of problems that we've got now uh, if we file them away? I believe that uh, biometrics will be a critical part of multi-factor authentication. Um, mm -hmm. it, if combined with a password and uh, a mobile device, right, it, you can fuse these things together in order to significantly improve uh, the, the security of a particular authentication to okay. some online service. Right. Second, secondary question, is, do you think it's right to think of every connected device as a potential vulnerability? Uh, and if so, what freedom or flexibility uh, should network operators have to promote security when device owners fail to do so? And I guess we're sort of getting into the Internet of Things, you know. Certainly. Um, so the, the Internet service providers have an increasingly challenging time uh, because of the rise of technologies like end-to-end -end encryption. It's very difficult for Internet service providers to tell the difference between uh, a botnet command and control packet or uh, a standard uh, IoT web service uh, traffic, mm -hmm. uh, just because they don't have the visibility that, that they would otherwise have. So I think that that, it, that creates problems for them that, that makes it a challenge for the entire ecosystem where uh, you need the IoT service providers and the device manufacturers and all of them to come together to come up with a common solution uh, for, for securing IoT. Okay. Uh, Ms. Toda, I apologize. I had a question for you, but I've run out of time. Uh, Madam Chair, I yield back. Well, we will also let you submit that question in writing. Okay, Ms. Clark, you're recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the FCC just announced the newest members of the Communication Security Reliability and Interoperability Council, a council established to make recommendations about the security, reliability, and resiliency of our communication systems. But as I've reviewed the names of the new members, I'm disappointed to see a lack of cybersecurity expertise on the council. As the author of the Cybersecurity Responsibility Act, my bill makes it clear that the FCC has a role in ensuring our commercial sector has protections in place to secure our communication networks from malicious cyber attacks. So, um, Ms. Tote, um, what 
role do you believe the federal government, in particular the FCC, has in protecting our nation's communication networks? Well, I think, um, again, we can look to the executive order um, that was uh, released by President Trump in May, which specifically calls out the FCC as having a role in protecting the communications infrastructure and working with the Secretary of Commerce and the Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security to initially look at the botnet mitigation, um, but then also looking at uh, clean pipes and where that goes. And so clearly, I think the government, the executive office, um, as well as industry believes that there's a role that it needs to play. So then it, it would be um, prudent to have some cybersecurity expertise on this council, wouldn't it? That would appear to be the case, absolutely. I don't know who those individuals are, so I don't know if, um, if they have them in any Just capacity. generally speaking. But I, I would say, I mean, this is the issue, the broader issue is that we have to be bringing cybersecurity expertise into all of these areas and that we have to be looking for that because cyber, that knowledge and that expertise has to be informing our policies because they don't even have to be cybersecurity policies, but they have an impact. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, Dr. Clancy, as part of Congress's resolution of disapproval that overturned the FCC's privacy protections, Congress also stripped away consumers' data security protections. As I noted before, my bill, the Cybersecurity Responsibility Act, would ask the FCC to take some action, any action, to protect our networks. Did Congress's rollback of these data security rules do anything to make Americans' personal information more secure? Um, well, I, uh, use your I, mic. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think the, um, the, the rollback of the, of the cybersecurity provisions in the FCC rulemaking from 2018, uh, was, um, actually happened before Congress acted, right? The FCC removed those provisions, um, uh, and stayed those portions of the regulation. And then ultimately Congress, uh, rescinded the entire order, uh, which was focused more on the privacy aspects of that rulemaking. Um, of course, the, the, the stated rationale was that it was inconsistent with the, uh, the Federal Trade Commission's view of, of privacy and opt-in versus opt-out when it comes to data uh, con consumer privacy. Um, I, I don't know that I'm in a position to, to declare whether opt-in or opt-out is a more appropriate way to protect uh, consumer privacy, um, but I think it represents some of the regulatory challenges we have uh, in, in, in asserting that one particular regulator has authority over a very complex ecosystem. Or, or, or the, the question was more about security and, and just looking at the ecosystem, if you uh, sort of strip uh, uh, those or roll back those security rules, we're, we're trying to figure out whether people's personal information uh, it becomes, did we open up vulnerabilities? Let's, let's put it so, that way. So, based on my experience working with the cellular industry and, and some of the major internet service providers, um, the, the, big, the big companies are, are, are already doing those best practices. The, the large ISPs, the large wireless carriers are already doing that. Where the gap is, is the smaller and more rural internet service providers and the more niche uh, uh, wireless carriers who don't have as much infrastructure or resources themselves to deploy those best practices. Yeah, so when there's a vulnerability, even in the smallest of these providers, doesn't that open up opportunities to get at grander? Certainly, it, it does, given the, the interconnectedness of, of, the, of the different telecom providers. Um, I think what we're seeing in industry is strong collaboration, though, with uh, the big guys looking out for the small guys and, and doing what they can to help uh, quickly remediate through uh, information sharing that was uh, uh, really accelerated by the, the past. Anyone else have any uh, thoughts on that? I, I think the supply chain is a huge issue, and even if you're sharing those practices, we have to be looking at baseline level of standards, and I think that you're, oh, it's always going to be the weakest link, and we have to do a better job within our sectors of actually informing and helping to share those best practices and lessons learned. One of the things that we've learned is that small businesses across sector have a lot more in common with each other than small businesses and the large businesses within their sector. Mm. And there's a lot of evidence right now around that. And so being able to look at this more thoughtfully, and I think it goes again to this issue of collaboration and pre-event planning um, would be the actions that we need to be taking. Very well. Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. And Mr. Bill Arrakis, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it so much, and I appreciate your testimony uh, today. Uh, as more IoT devices enter the market, industry has seen a rise in tech support scams, unfortunately. Uh, 
Symantec's uh, 2016 threat report found a 200% uh, rise in tech support scams in a two-year period. With these types of threats, the best defense is with the end user. Uh, Mr. Wright, how can an end user distinguish between a legitimate help desk and a tech support scam? And can you describe how Symantec uh, has responded to the increased threat? Yeah, so these types of social engineering attacks, um, as you just mentioned, the, the tech support are particularly vexing. They depend on the consumer to some be, somehow be able to um, uh, intuit or to understand whether or not they are being, um, whether they are being scammed. There's not a lot of uh, sort of technology that can fix that. A lot of it comes back to raising awareness of the user of what those threats could be, those users being more careful and perhaps having a more uh, keen eye on uh, to, to, uh, to, you know, to pick up signs. Uh, but it is a very, very difficult problem when it comes down to uh, the user, um, user themselves. Okay. Thank you. Uh, for years, people have been told to check for the HTTPS identifier in their browser before accessing personal websites, such as for banking or healthcare. Uh, Mr. Wright, again, your, your 2016 threat report states that the re relying on the HTTPS marking provides a false sense of security. Can you expand upon that? I'm sorry. Your, your findings. No, let me let me say it again. Uh, your 2016 threat report states that relying on the HTTPS mm -hmm. uh, marking provides a false sense of security. Can you expand on that finding? Um, I know that HTTPS is more protected, um, but I'm sorry, I cannot sort of expand on the on the uh, the Internet Security Threat Report piece. There, I'm not prepared for that. Okay, can on maybe anyone has? else on the panel? Yes, please. Uh, so, so HTTPS implies that the session is authenticated and, and encrypted, but um, the concern is to whom you are authenticated. Uh, oh, there are many scams that can change a letter in the name of the domain name such that you wouldn't notice the difference but could still present a secure credential to you as, as a user. So I think uh, HTTPS is, uh, is a, a first step. If you don't have that, then you definitely need to be concerned. Mm -hmm. um, but there are other, um, uh, it, you need to look at the spelling of the domain name to make sure that is, it's, it's, uh, it's spelled accurately and there aren't strange characters in there that... Uh, uh, those are the sorts of things that undermine the security of simply looking for the HTTPS. Any other uh, suggestions? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's see, I've got one, I've still got a little time. Mr. Wright, uh, according to Symantec uh, 2016 threat report, the Apple iOS system faced its first widespread threat with the Xcode, uh, Xcode ghost attack. This malware has infected over 4,000 apps, which leaves unsuspecting uh, device, uh, devices vulnerable. In response to cyber threats, success largely depends on speed of response. How has industry responded to threats via apps since, its first, uh, since it first, first took hold in 2015 and have efforts met uh, uh, the su success? Yeah, good question. So. Yeah. Um, App certainly represents um, a potential threat vector, um, especially for mobile devices. Um, I would say that um, Apple has done a pretty good job making sure that malicious apps are not uh, included in their app store. Android is doing a better job um, at, uh, at trying to ensure that uh, their apps aren't malicious. Um, so those two providers, I think, have come a long way. Um, Apple's always been pretty good, but the other provider it's come a long way. Uh, in addition, there are some security solutions to this. Um, uh, not plugging Symantec, but we do produce um, um, uh, technology that can scan for apps and look for possible malicious um, uh, apps or grayware apps, which sometimes can leak information. So there's a technology solution, and then also the providers are doing a lot of work in that area as well. Anyone else want to add something? I know I only have, I only have 15 seconds. Okay, very good. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's a very informative hearing. Thanks for calling the hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Eshu, five minutes. I thank the Chairwoman, uh, and I thank all the witnesses. Um, I think you've given very important uh, testimony. Um, uh, first of all, to, um, uh, to Mr. Uh, Wright, uh, 
I'm very proud to represent Symantec. Thank you. The long, long, long-term relationship going back to the days of uh, of John and and uh, uh, how he really helped build a new Symantec. And it's uh, you keep going and uh, you're a real asset to the uh, to the country and to Mr. Yoran. Um, you get the prize for the best dressed before this subcommittee every time you come. Uh, <laughs> one of the members said, do you think he lost his suitcase? <laughs> I said, no, he hasn't lost his suitcase. That's his, um, that's his tuxedo uh, <laughs> for, this, uh, for this committee. Um, you've all, uh, uh, there, there's been a, a, a lot of discussion about a lot of things here. The, the, uh, uh, the title of the hearing is, uh, 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 cybersecurity risk to wireless networks. Uh, but this is an entire ecosystem. And I, I think we've made real progress in many areas. Um, and I think that obviously we're lacking uh, in others. Uh, I, I want to thank Symantec for working with me on the uh, legislation that I uh, mentioned in my brief uh, opening statement. Uh, but I, I want to go to something else. Um, uh, uh, first, and then uh, a question to each one of you. Last year, the FCC put into place um, uh, data security rules uh, that apply uh, to, uh, uh, to wireless carriers as part of its uh, privacy uh, proceeding. And Dr. Clancy, you just gave some kind of, I, I don't know really what it was, but I'm going to find out more, press you for more. <laughs> These rules asked uh, ISPs um, really something very simple. And that is to take, quote, reasonable measures, reasonable measures to protect consumer data. Now, there was the monetization uh, of, um, of information uh, uh, and, uh, and, and the monetization of attacks that's been brought up by uh, more than one panel member this morning. Do you think that the, uh, do any of you think that the FCC went too far in asking ISPs to act reasonably to protect uh, consumer data. There's a little bit of, um, if I might suggest this, political cross-dressing that's going on here because the Congress ripped away all privacy protections on the internet. Right. And that's on the um, computer that I have in my purse. That's for everyone in the country. So we're talking about, I, I think that um, cybersecurity is all about privacy. Mm -hmm. It brings about privacy. So uh, maybe a yes or no to each one of you. And if you don't know, then say that. Do you think the, the FCC went too far in uh, 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 at asking for reasonable measures to, concept, uh, to uh, protect consumer data? I'm going to start with... Um, so I have to say I don't know too much about okay. that specifically, but I will say it, uh, you know, it appears to be reasonable to protect yeah. user data. I can't comment specifically to uh, the FCC's uh, um, issue, but reasonable does sound reasonable. Mm -hmm. uh, indeed. I mean, it was, it was a complicated set of, of circumstances. What's so complicated about it? Um. What's complicated <laughs> about it? I have it right here, what they, what they uh, put forward. They're really simple things. Mm -hmm. uh, reasonable is reasonable. I'll ditto my colleagues. Absolutely. I mean, reasonable protections are reasonable. Okay. I think what I'd like to do in writing, because I don't have time for it, uh, is to ask um, each one of you, so you can be prepared for it, what is your top line recommendation to the subcommittee relative to cybersecurity in our country? Just one thing, top line, from each one of you. You're all experts, and I'll look forward to sending that to you and getting your responses. Thank you for what you're doing for the American people. I appreciate it. All right. Let's see. We are Mr. Flores. You're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I want to thank the panel for being here today. Uh, Ms. Talk. Uh, unlike other types of crimes, uh, when we talk about cybercrime, we always seem to focus on the need to protect against the attacks uh, rather than prosecute the bad actors. And can you tell us what the federal government is doing to actively work on cybercrime attribution? And also, what are the limitations of trying to, type, uh, to track down our cyber adversaries? 
So right now, I believe the executive order has laid out. I'm not as familiar with the, the criminal angle. I know um, we worked with the Department of Justice um, with the commission on being able to look at malicious actors and where the crime plays a role. And I think one of the key things that a lot of the commissioners talked about is you have to have penalties for those bad actors. But I apologize, I can't um, talk extensively, but I'm happy to get back to you with an answer in writing. Okay, yeah, if you could do that, that would be great. Uh, Dr. Clancy, uh, in your testimony today and from uh, testimony across the panel, it, it sounds like we don't have, we have got a skills gap when it comes to um, uh, protecting our, our uh, cells from uh, uh, cyber crime. What, um, and of course, in order to fill the pipeline, we're gonna have to be able to get our educational institutions to produce uh, the, uh, the, the people resources to be able to, to, um, uh, to deal with this. I represent uh, three world-class universities back in my district, Texas A&M University, Baylor University, and the University of Texas. What could the federal government be doing uh, to help ensure that pipeline is, is filled with quality, uh, skilled individuals? I think that most of the efforts to date have focused on the tail end of the pipeline, getting right. students out of college and into jobs. I think the pipeline starts much earlier than that. Exactly. Uh, when students are coming into college, they want they need to want to major in cybersecurity and more broadly in STEM fields. So I, th I think uh, additional initiatives that are focusing it focused on the K through 12 uh, outreach and engagement to bring cybersecurity down to the middle school level or, or even sooner. Um, uh, just basic digital hygiene at, 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 at the elementary school level would be a great starting point and, and build up from there. Uh, if, if you want to build a pipeline, you need to start at, uh, start at the beginning. Okay. Uh, Mr. Yorn, you and, you and I both have business backgrounds. What, I mean, you, and you hire a lot of these types of individuals. What, what would your uh, key recommendations be? Yeah, I, th I think it's important for um, uh, employers to look for the intellectual curiosity around cyber and, and uh, as uh, Dr. Clancy said earlier, you know, I, I think it, you have to start at an earlier age and part of it may be through cyber hygiene. I know I could talk to my kids about cyber hygiene and they still don't apply their patches. <laughs> so I think we have to find things that are more interesting, more intriguing uh, ways of creating excitement and creativity around cybersecurity education. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Clancy, um, you mentioned the need for the federal government to continue to act as a convener and to set priorities uh, based on its uh, unique knowledge of cyber threats, but for national security reasons, the government doesn't always share the full extent of its knowledge of those threats. Uh, how significant is this limitation and how can Congress be helpful in encouraging more transparent threat intelligence sharing? So I think from a convening perspective, groups like the FCC's CISRIC organization is, is a great way for the government, uh, for the Federal Communications Commission to, to sort of set priorities and identify areas of concern and work collaboratively with industry to identify uh, solutions. Um, I think that that goes to a certain extent hand in hand with the challenges of cyber information sharing. Um, you have uh, the national security agencies who are generating detailed information on cyber threat um, but that is uh, due to the sources and methods involved, uh, is, is held at a classified level and, and can't be shared. Um, and that, that creates a barrier to sharing. Mm -hmm. um, the thought is that if we have sufficiently large uh, cyber threat brokerage houses sort of emerging, uh, that there can be enough data that um, uh, the federal government could anonymously share data that would obscure sources and methods uh, with those brokerages and it wouldn't be attributable to mm. specific, uh, uh, specific sensitive um, uh, uh, aspects of, of how that data was arrived at. Now we're not there yet, but I think there's some hope that that may be a solution moving forward uh, mm. long term. Okay, thank you. If any of you have any supplemental comments on any of these questions, you can get submit those, that'd be great. And thank you, I yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Rush, you're recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and want to commend you for holding this this hearing. Uh, Dr. Clancy, uh, Tom. <laughs> uh, you are concerned that the Internet of Things, the IoT, uh, where everything from home appliance to industrial infrastructure devices connected to the Internet is not secure enough to withstand a cyber attack. 
what is the biggest challenge you see in securing this complex mobile ecosystem? Well, I think that uh, the, just the breadth, as, as, you, as you stated, is, is part of the challenge. The threats to uh, an Internet-connected uh, home appliance are very different than the threats to an Internet-connected uh, nuclear reactor. Um, and the technologies involved are very different. So at one end of the spectrum in the consumer technology space, uh, we have um, a, 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 the key challenge, I think, is, is supply chain and um, uh, inexpensive goods inexpensive IoT devices coming from overseas that uh, were not designed with security as, as part of the, the fundamental component. I think at the other end of the spectrum, you have industrial infrastructure, industrial control systems. There the challenge is more that um, uh, the desire to gain efficiencies from uh, aging infrastructure uh, and be able to support more users with the same power grid and more, more peak demand requires uh, us to use artificial intelligence to orchestrate much of our uh, infrastructure, which necessitates connecting that infrastructure to the cloud in order to do the needed big data processing on the data. So you end up drawing this sort of uh, this series of events that, that, that necessitates for business reasons connecting this industrial infrastructure to the cloud, which then fundamentally exposes it to risks it, it had never faced before. Um, and that is a whole separate set of challenges that uh, it requires uh, the, the, the key components of that industry to figure out how to work together to solve, um, solve those, those, those challenges. Are you concerned that the uh, federal government uh, is uh, inadequate and it presently is uh, organized that we are, that there, are we prepared to deal with this broad threat, a cybersecurity threat. I mean, we have different uh, centers of responsibility, authority, and power located uh, in many different places from Homeland Security to the FCC. Are we prepared in a streamlined way to respond to a cyber attack using this, these IOTs? I think we w are never going to be as prepared as we would like to be, but I think our level of preparedness is, is steadily increasing. Um, I, I think the, the NIST cybersecurity framework that many have referenced throughout this hearing is a great example of a, uh, a, a, a tool that we can use to develop a common understanding of, of how to respond to these threats, um, and we need more things like that uh, to help uh, improve our, our ability to respond. One thing, I want to move to uh, uh, Mr. Wright. <clears throat> Mr. Wright, how vulnerable is the U.S. power grid to a similar power grid attack that Ukraine suffered last year? Excuse me. Yes, we've um, referring to what we called sandworm threat. It uh, attacked the Ukraine uh, two different times over the last year, shutting down power. Interestingly, they got back online relatively fast because they went back to manual, uh, manual movements. Um, here in the U.S., I think we are probably more advanced on our security of those power grids. Um, more than that, I think that our people are uh, trained to be able to get back online manually um, because of threats and storms and, and natural disasters that they have trained uh, to be able to get back online and to be able to do that manually. Um, that said, there's always going to be uh, susceptibility, um, and with the with the with the latest um, Ellen Nakashima article that came out yesterday, uh, advising of a of a new, uh, more advanced threat, um, I am sure that our our uh, power grid operators and government are looking at how to protect against those. I thank the gentleman, Ms. Brooks. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you for um, to all of our panelists for your uh, for sharing your background and your wisdom with us. Um, it seems that part of the problem we face is that cyber attacks, and we talk about cybersecurity, it, it's moving far faster, it seems, than our cyber defenses. And uh, the bad guys only have to be right once, while the good guys have to be right all of the time. Um, I'm a, a former U.S. attorney, and, uh, but from 01 to 07, when we were really standing up cyber teams, 
Uh, and I certainly know the FBI and obviously NSA and others have really beefed up their cybersecurity, but yet I'm, I'm a bit troubled um, that, because I was just uh, you know Googling big cyber cases and so forth, and uh, they seem to be happening more in other countries than they're happening in our country. And I'm just curious how much cooperation is there with the private sector lending your advice to the government sector in uh, prosecuting and enforcing our, our cyber uh, laws. And uh, I'm, I'm concerned that your expertise and the expertise of those in your industry um, it's hard for government to bring folks in. As you said, I believe, Mr. Yorn, that often it goes the other way. They start in government, then go out to the private sector. But yet, if we aren't cooperating, and I think at a very different level than we currently are, and I appreciate your work and what the commissions have done and, and recommendations and so forth, but I, I think we need to accelerate it in a much greater way of how we can prevent, not just prevent, because you're all focused on preventing, but if we don't actually prosecute, and uh, Mr. Wright, would you like to start us out? And I sure. really need to hear what your thoughts are about the level of government's willingness to bring your expertise to the table to help us, you know, stop these people by actually prosecuting. Yeah, I think you make an, an absolute excellent point there. There is a focus on protection, um, whereas rarely do we speak about deterrence. Um, one of the main deterrents is prosecuting. Um, I would say that the FBI in particular has gotten much better. In fact, I would put them at very good uh, at this point. They're recruiting the right people. They are going after um, um, the, the cyber criminals. And maybe if you don't read about it as much um, here in the United States, because a lot of our adversaries, cybercrime adversaries, are sitting overseas. Very tough to prosecute in those cases. Uh, but I will tell you one uh, good story that happened uh, right at the beginning of this year, uh, Symantec uh, partnered with the FBI and worked on a case we refer to as Bay Rob. It went on for nine years. Um, we had finally culminated in the arrest and extradition of three uh, Romanian citizens that are currently sitting uh, sitting here in the U.S. awaiting awaiting trial. Um, those connections that, um, that private sector companies are making with law enforcement are getting better every day. They're getting more and more trusted. Um, I actually think that is a good news story uh, for us now. But w I think the focusing on um, on some sort of uh, uh, deterrence is really important because today cybercrime has all upside and no downside. There are no risks, very few risks involved in being in cybercrime. Thank you, Mr. Uren. Any comments you might have? And should we be looking at a different model of how government is working with the private sector to bring people to justice? Because yeah. nine years and three defendants doesn't sound like enough to me. No. But I applaud it, <laughs> but nine years and three defendants. And, and I'm sure there's a, a, a lot of detail to that case, and, and uh, we'll point to, uh, to many follow-on cases and, and, and other investigations. I think you bring up a very important point. Um, there are uh, many cooperative effort, efforts between law enforcement and private industry. Uh, a few areas where private industry has really augmented what has been uh, traditional government function is in the area of attack attribution and threat intelligence of which uh, Symantec and, uh, you know, is a very active participant. And that can aid and assist law enforcement and also help create deterrence, whether it's through naming and shaming or, or other uh, means. There are also remains, I think, a reasonable gap between the interest of law enforcement of, and those uh, trying to defend networks where um, there are instances where you know law enforcement officials would like to for the purposes of uh, prosecuting a crime leave systems open and and to continue to monitor how uh, uh, a crime is unfolding whereas those trying to defend networks frequently care a little bit less about who's doing it and more about cleaning up their systems my time is up but if any of you would have any other comments you'd like to make would certainly uh, appreciate uh, any written comments on it. Thank you. I yield Thank back. you, gentlelady. And Mr. Costello for five minutes.
outside. The, the capacity and capability far exceeds, I'm sorry, what? Well, I think that certainly on, on this side, um, mobile phones, consumers are sort of just hitting the beginning of what, of what they eventually are going to do um, with, with, uh, with, with mobile devices. As far as concern about where those mobile devices are um, being built, um, you know, I think that, I think that um, some of these su supply chains are always going to be uh, important and can open up some, uh, some possible vulnerabilities. We need to be able to have an understanding of where not only the device is put together, but where those individual pieces are manufactured and pulled into the uh, pulled into the device, because they can certainly um, open yourself up to, to, to vulnerabilities. I want to pick up uh, on the line of inquiry uh, that Miss Brooks was pursuing, and that is uh, seems to me distinguishing between lawful, legitimate activity and unlawful activity of uh, someone engaged in a cybersecurity crime is often uh, difficult to discern until it's too late. And uh, whether it's um, the cloud, whether it's wireless access points, uh, I was reading a little bit in the testimony about the mobile device management solutions. The question I have here is, um, is our criminal code uh, does it reflect the technological capacity of cyber crime as it stands today? Or are we sort of, uh, is it antiquated? Does it need to evolve? Or does it need to be, does it need to reflect the way that criminal activity occurs? Because oftentimes a crime, a crime could be happening and yet we're not able to call it a crime because the actual, um, malware or the actual money hasn't been stolen or a piece of the, the, the last piece of the crime which would actually make a criminal hasn't yet occurred. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so my question uh, to, to any of you is, be it with wireless access points, be it with just uh, how often we use the cloud, do you see certain types of cyber criminal activity where our criminal code does not properly reflect what is happening day in and day out in such a manner that we're able to go and prevent crimes from happening because there's because our criminal code does not um, have the the elements to be able to have us sufficient sufficiently uh, charge them with a crime early enough before it's too late anyone I, I think the industry obviously um, industry has a, a thoughtful perspective on this and I know Semantic has done some tremendous work in this in this space. There's an entity called the Ni National Cyber Forensics and Training uh, Analysis Center, which um, works with the FBI, with consumers, with law enforcement to understand where the criminal code is aligned with cyber crime. And I know that they are working on revising it where necessary, um, because I think you know to the point that was made uh, rightly, it's it's this deterrence effort, but updating just as we need to do across all elements of cybersecurity. We tend to have a physical approach to cyber crime sometimes and understanding that um, that the NCFTA, I believe, is looking at that specifically. Yeah, I would just say I, yeah, I agree there are some sort of unique things about um, uh, pursuing and prosecuting a cyber case, chain of custody of evidence is right. one of them. Um, I can't think of sort of specific incidences where we're crosswise with um, you know, with the with the laws, but um, but that's certainly something um, I think they could look into. I, there is one area, uh, the way that we uh, share information, um, uh, prosecutorial information with other countries, our MLAT process, our mutual legal assistance treaties, um, I believe are outdated. Um, they need to be, uh, they probably need to be revised so that we can share information, we can have information shared with us so that we can prosecute better. The concern I have, and my time is over, is just, just given the dir the lack uh, or small number of instances we're, we're able to prosecute on this tells me that there's just there's just too much and there's no risk. I think that was the term that you used. There's no risk to not engage in cybersecurity crimes when you're these actors, and that's terribly concerning. And it just raises the question to me on the criminal side of it: Is there more that we can do to enable the prosecution of this uh, more easily? I yield back. Mm -hmm. Gentleman yells back, and there are no further members seeking times.
for questions. Uh, pursuant to committee rules, I remind members that they have 10 business days to submit additional questions, and I think you all are probably aware you've got written questions coming to you. We would ask that you respond to those written questions within 10 business days and get that back to us. It is a hearing where there is a good bit of interest and we look forward to moving um, forward on this issue this year. So seeing no further business to come to the subcommittee today, the committee is adjourned. <laughs>